Good morning and welcome back. Um, for those of you who don't remember my name, it's Cindy Jeffries and those listening from the public who are joining us for the first time. I'm a federal mediator with FMCS and I'll be your facilitator for the morning session. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all back to session four of the United States Department of Education's Negotiated Rulemaking Student Debt Relief Committee. At this time, I'd like to welcome back the federal negotiator, Tammy Abernathy, and turn it over to her. Tammy? Thank you, Cindy. Good morning, and welcome to this session of negotiations relating to student debt relief, specifically the proposed regulations on the Secretary's authority to waive student loan debt based on a borrower's hardship. Before we get started, please join me in welcoming Undersecretary James Kowal to provide our opening remarks. Undersecretary Kowal? Thanks, Tammy. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Good morning. Uh, appreciate your coming back for this fourth round of uh, rulemaking as we, we try to do everything we can to deliver student debt relief to as many borrowers as possible as quickly as possible. And as the Secretary has said repeatedly, President Biden and the Biden Harris administration is not going to leave any stone unturned in our work to provide relief to borrowers. Seven and a half million borrowers are now enrolled in the SAVE plan, the most affordable plan in history. And President Biden announced yesterday that 153,000 borrowers have now earned loan forgiveness under the SAVE plan. Including these borrowers, nearly 3.9 million people have now been identified for loan relief due to the actions of this administration, including public servants, borrowers with disabilities, and borrowers who were ripped off by for-profit colleges. But we're not done yet. We know that despite all of these efforts, there are still people who need help with their student loans and they're not getting it. This committee has helped us draft four additional plans to offer relief to struggling borrowers, and thank you for that work. And today we continue turning over another stone with a focus on borrowers experiencing hardship. Our goal here is to advance a regulatory proposal that focuses on the Secretary's existing and longstanding waiver authority to clarify how the department will consistently and transparently deliver relief to borrowers. The proposal the committee will consider today outlines a few new ways to help borrowers who are struggling to make payments on their loans. In other words, delivering relief to borrowers facing hardship. One way we can provide critical breathing room to these borrowers is to identify factors that may affect a borrower's ability to repay their loans and show hardship, including a borrower's total student loan balance, how much they have to pay compared to their income, and whether a borrower has a student loan debt that interferes with paying for basic needs like getting food on the table and access to health care for their families. This proposal would also allow the department to provide automatic relief to borrowers who are likely to be default in default within two years. This is critical. A big reason the president has been pushing for student debt relief is to address the fact that before the pandemic, millions of borrowers struggled to repay their loans. By and large, borrowers who are struggling are people who have been failed by broken policies. And our student loan default system drives borrowers who are already facing financial hardships into a deeper hole. Today's proposal also leaves open paths for additional ideas on individualized relief or other automatic processes. And it was developed after careful consideration of the ideas suggested by members of this committee, so thank you. In addition to the negotiator's feedback, we hope members of the public will watch the session and we welcome them to register to provide public testimony. And as always, there will be a later opportunity to submit written comments on the draft rules. I mentioned earlier that this committee has already discussed four other proposals for student debt relief. We took final consensus checks on those items in our December session, so we won't be discussing them today. But as a reminder, those categories are borrowers whose outstanding loan balances are more than they originally borrowed, borrowers with loans that are older than 20 or 25 years, borrowers who have been taken advantage of by career training programs that left them with high debt and no credential or who attended schools with unacceptably high default rates, and borrowers who are otherwise eligible for loan forgiveness but haven't yet applied for relief. I wanna thank 
the negotiators for all the work they put in thus far and for joining us in this additional session. And I want to thank the staff of the department who have been working very hard uh, for many months now to go through these proposals, the feedback we've received from the committee and at other steps of this process, and all the background work to make these rulemaking sessions successful. Your work hasn't gone unnoticed and I appreciate everything you've done and your commitment to providing relief to students. So thanks everybody and uh, on behalf of the department, I look forward to some productive conversations today. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Under Secretary. We appreciate your presence and your comment. Um, at this point in time, we're going to take official roll call of record. And so when I call your name, if you will just uh, indicate your presence um, for civil rights organizations, Wisdom Cole. Here. India Hextall. Here. Thank you both. Legal assistance organizations that represent students or borrowers. Uh, Kara Taylor is the um, primary, but she's unable to t attend today or tomorrow. So in her absence, Scott Waterman, the alternate, will preside at the table. Scott? I'm here. OK, thank you. State officials, including state higher education executive officers, state authorizing agencies, and state regulators of institutions of higher education. Lane Thompson. Here, good morning. Hi, Lane. And her alternate, Amber, Amber Gallup, will not be joining us um, for either day. State Attorney Generals, Yael Shavit. Here. Hi. And uh, the uh, alternate slot in that continues to be vacant. Public institutions of higher education, including two year and four year institutions, Melissa Coons. I am here. Good morning. Good morning, JD Lorac. He doesn't look like he is able to join us. Private nonprofit institutions of higher education, Angelica Williams. Good morning, I'm here. Hi, she is the primary. And she's joined by her alternate, Susan Ternick. I'm here. Thank you. Hi. You're welcome. Welcome to you both. Proprietary institutions. Primary is Kathleen DeWire. Good morning. Good morning. And alternate, Belen Gonzalez. Belen was here, but it looks like she's left. Historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, and minority serving institutions, institutions of higher education eligible to receive federal assistance under Title III, Parts A and F, and Title V of the HEA. Sandra Bohan is primary, and she is not able to join today or tomorrow. So Carol Peterson, the alternate, will be presiding at the table. Carol? Good morning, I'm here. Good morning. Federal Family Education Loans, or FFEL, Lenders, Services, or Guarantee Agencies. Scott Buchanan is primary. Scott, are you with us? Good morning. Good morning. And Benjamin Lee, uh, his alternate, is not able to attend today or tomorrow. Student loan borrowers who attended programs of two years or less. Primary Ashley Pizzuti. Good morning. Good morning. And David Ramirez, her alternate, is tentative. Are you here, David? Okay. He may join later on. Um, Student loan borrowers who attended four-year programs. The primary, Sherry Gamage, is unable to attend. So the alternate, Sarah Krista Butts, will preside at the table in her absence. Sarah? Present. Good morning. Good morning. Student loan borrowers who attended graduate programs, Richard Haas is primary. Good morning, uh, and actually for today and tomorrow, uh, Jaleel Bishop and I will be switching. I'll be the alternate and he will be primary. OK, all right, but um, just make a note that when it comes to consensus taking tomorrow, 
you if you are present, you are the one that partakes in that. OK, OK. All right. Thanks. And Dr. Jewel Bishop. Hello Good morning. here. Good morning. Currently enrolled post-secondary education students, Jada Samford is unable to attend. So Jordan Nellens, the alternate, um, will be presiding. Jordan. Good morning here. Good morning. U.S. military service members, veterans, or groups representing them. Primary is Vincent Andrews. Yep, here. Aye, and the alternate is vacant. Consumer Advocates, Jessica Renucci as primary. Good morning. Good morning, and Ed Boltz as um, alternate. Good morning, I'm present. Good morning. And individuals with disabilities or groups representing them, John Whitelaw is primary. John? Good morning, friends and colleagues. Good morning, and Wachika Wilkerson, the alternate, is unable to attend. And of course, we have our um, federal negotiator, Tammy Abernathy. Here. Uh, welcome back again, Tammy. Thank you, from, Cindy. All right. So non-voting members present today are from OGC are Brian Siegel, Tony Merrill, Gen Z Torres, and Soren Lagarde. They will be um, assisting off and on. The rest of the FM. CS team that is present with me today is Mike Franzak, Brady Roberts, and John Weathers. We will, uh, now we're going to address the process for the next two days, and then we'll be turning it over to Amy for her comments and to get us started. So first, let me remind you all to adhere to the naming convention, please. P for primary, A for alternate, followed by your name. And lastly, the constituency you are representing. Um, note on the chat feature, it will remain enabled during our sessions together. Please know that all messages sent out to the full group are subject to an ongoing transcript that will be posted publicly on the OPE site after the negotiations. I want to remind everyone that the protocols that you agreed to in the first um, three sessions are still in effect for this session and will be adhered to. These two days will solely be focused on the topic of hardship, which the department has provided all of you with proposed regulatory text. We will not be reopening any previous issues or regulatory text that were discussed and consensus was taken on during the first three sessions. If the primary for a constituency group is unable to attend this session, the alternate will serve in the absence for the purpose of consensus, which will be held on day two of this session. If both the primary and alternate are unable to attend, it will not hold up consensus. As many of your proposed changes, suggestions, and questions should be asked at the table or presented at the table to the extent possible. The department will address what they can, but no expectation of a response should be assumed. The department may accept written proposals, data requests, and questions. Given this session is two back-to-back -back days, the department will consider what they can at the end of today and before the start of tomorrow's sessions. There will be a public comment period at the end of today's session, and we have reserved one hour from three to four Eastern time for public comment. At that time, registered individuals will be admitted one at a time at their scheduled time into our Zoom Gov meeting from the waiting room and permitted three minutes to speak. They will be removed from the session when their remarks or time are completed. The department has posted the reg registration link for that on their website. There will be a different link for the afternoon session, which we will announce again just before lunch break. Now I'm going to turn it over to Tammy to begin review and discussion of the on the proposed regulatory text regarding hardship and any opening additional opening comments she'd like to make. Tammy. Thank you again, Cindy. I do want to make one clarifying statement from the remarks that you made because this is only a two session um, uh, 
fourth session for our rulemaking, we will not be filling data requests. So we ask that you um, respect that. We There's no way that we'd be able to get anything fulfilled before we have to end our negotiations. So I wanna take a few minutes to further explain the process for the next few days. We will review and discuss the proposed regulatory text today and tomorrow. And while the department may consider changes, you may suggest to the proposed regulations, we may need additional time to consider your suggestions. And as with our prior sessions, we just cannot guarantee we will accept those suggested changes. This is the final negotiated rulemaking session on student debt relief. Since we are only discussing one section, we're not going to do temperature checks. We are going to ask for final consensus on this section of the proposed regulatory text overall and not on individual pieces by the end of tomorrow's session. During this session, we are not going to discuss the other items that we took final consensus checks on in December. Our screen sharers will now share our section 30.91. Most of the regulatory text sections we discussed in our prior sessions were within newly proposed subpart G of 34 Code of Federal Regulations Part 30 and covered section, section 30.80 through section 30.90. This language will be included in subpart G proposed new section 30.91. We're going to start with an overview of the proposed regulatory text. We appreciate all the white papers, information, and proposals for the hardship category that many of you provided last session. This is a very complex topic, and we thank you for the input that you did provide to us. The department's regulatory proposal focuses on our existing and long-standing waiver authority to clarify how the department will consistently and transparently deliver relief to as many borrowers as possible as quickly as possible with the focus in this session on borrowers who have, who have experienced or are experiencing hardship. This proposed regulatory text defines the conditions that may be considered as hardship for purposes of debt relief. The regulations also identify the factors that may indicate hardship. Once finalized, the regulatory text would provide the department with the structure to offer multiple pathways to relief. The proposed text outlines an automatic pathway for relief for borrowers at heightened risk of default using such factors. It also describes a pathway for relief through an application. However, important questions remain with respect to administrative cap capacity and how the factors could be considered for determining relief for specific borrowers who apply. We are seeking input from you and through the public comment process. As a reminder, because this language is within subpart G of part 30, this proposed regulatory language applies to department held loans, including direct loans, federal family education loans, FEL loans, Perkins loans, and health education assistance loans or HEAL loans. This language does not cover FEL loans held by lenders, institutional held Perkins loans and HEAL, and HEAL loans in repayment. Let's first look at the overall structure of the text and how each paragraph relates to the others. Broadly speaking, paragraph A would set a standard for student debt relief based on borrower hardship. Paragraph B lays out a list of non-exclusive relevant factors that the secretary may use in determining whether a borrower has or is experiencing hardship. Paragraphs C and D describe how the department will deliver the relief. At this time, I'd like the screen share to share paragraph A of the text, please. The department proposes two standards for determining hardship. First, we would determine if a borrower is experiencing or has experienced hardship based on whether such hardship is likely to impair the borrower's ability to fully repay the federal government. This may be determined by considering the factors enumerated in paragraph B, as well as any other factors the secretary determines relevant. The factors laid out in paragraph B may impact whether a borrower is capable of fully repaying off their debt over the life of the loan without some form of debt relief. Second, the department would determine hardship based on whether the costs of enforcing the full amount of the debt 
are not justified by the expected benefits of continued collection of the entire debt. This is an independent standard for relief. A borrower may be eligible for relief under this standard, even if the borrower is not eligible for relief based on their inability to fully repay. The secretary may determine the costs and benefits of collection by considering the factors enumerated in paragraph B, as well as any other factors the secretary determines are relevant to showing hardship. The regulatory text does not define costs, and the concept broadly includes a number of ways of thinking about costs. For example, the secretary could consider costs beyond costs to the government. Once finalized, these regulations would specify clear standards for the department's consideration of student debt forgiveness based on borrower hardship. These standards are distinct from the Federal Claims Collection Standards, or FCCS, because the FCCS are not specific to the kind of relief that would be provided by the proposed text. These standards draw on principles the government commonly considers in deciding whether to forgive outstanding debts. In this case, however, these standards specifically apply to student loans, not any other type of debt owed to the department. The standards would not only allow automatic relief as described in paragraph C, but would also provide the department with the ability to establish pathways to relief based on the factors in paragraph B through an automatic process or an application-based process in the future. I'd like to turn it over to FMCS now to open up the discussion and answer any questions on paragraph A. Okay, thank you, Chami. If we could um, stop the screen share. Appreciate it. I want to give a thanks to everyone behind the scenes making all of this work for us. Our screen sharers, I believe, is Vanessa Freeman today and um, all of the wonderful production team that's making the live broadcast work for us. So with that, let's open up for discussion on paragraph A of the regulator proposed regulatory text. Jessica Renucci. Good morning. I have a couple of specific things that I'll get back in line, but I just wanted to kick this off by saying that I strongly support the department's proposal to extend its waiver authority to situations based on financial hardship. I think you heard loud and clear from the committee last time that this was really important to our constituencies. Um, you know, personally, I will say we have, you know, many, many, many clients who experience significant financial hardship and for whom regulations like this can be a, a critical benefit. People who, you know, were here in New York City have trouble affording, afford housing, afford food, um, and who are saddled with student loan debt. So I want to thank the department. I think you heard us. I think uh, I appreciate that you called us back here and um, that, you know, I hope that, you know, we're able to negotiate throughout the day. I think that, you know, I have some feedback. You'll hear from me, but just to start off on that note. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Yayo? Um, I, I wanna also add my my thanks. It was really heartening to see the NEGREG scheduled um, and I'm really enthusiastic about uh, what will be achieved over the course of the next couple of days. So really many thanks to Ed for going through this process and bringing us back here. Um, and I will also sort of get back in line for more specific points, but I do, I do wanna note that I, um, support and think it's very important uh, to take a broad approach to costs as you described, Tammy. I think that there are a lot of costs that um, the department should take into consideration, including uh, the um, uh, impact of um, continued, continuing to need to uh, make efforts to repay debt on people based on the circumstances that are um, that Ed is informed of when people who are facing a hardship do in fact raise um, uh, raise their hardship to the department and ensuring that the department has the greatest flexibility to consider such costs, I think is critical. So thank you for that clarification as well. Thank you, Yael. Uh, Jalil. Thank you. Um, again, I'll echo the sentiments that um, just express appreciation to the department for creating another session so that we can um, we really have a discussion around hardship, which I think is kind of the cornerstone of um, this rulemaking process that for us to be able to really 
use an evidence-based approach to identify and not leave borrowers behind, but try to create um, a broad approach to include borrowers who really are in need and who are experiencing hardship. Um, just appreciation there and, you know, appreciation to the advocates both in and off the committee who really helped to make this session happen. Um, and I think one question I have for the department, if we could just, it would help me if you could voice over a little bit more um, what's meant by borrower's ability to fully repay. So um, does this mean that a, borrow, a borrower cannot repay within a certain amount of time? Does this mean if a borrower um, is showing some type of indication that that payment is unlikely? But just try, for me, it would be helpful if I could get a little more voiceover around a borrower's ability to fully repay and what we mean by fully. Thank you for asking that. The factors laid out in paragraph B can impact whether a borrower ultimately is capable of fully paying off their debt over the life of the loan without some form of debt relief. I think that some of our conversations will help us form and formulate new ideas as to how to identify the very things that you're mentioning, Jaleel. And so I think as we go through the day, and we go through the rest of the reg text, I think it will, we want to seek your input. We want to hear from you on this. We want to know what you think about certain things and, and giving us some ideas to where we could enhance what we're already trying to put at the table. Thank you both. Um, Lane, you're next. Yeah, I have a question and a comment. Um, my comment is that I would like to see cost applied in a very broad manner, mostly to say that there's cost to communities, to states, to schools, to, you know, lots of institutions as well. Um, so just kind of saying that I really appreciate that inclusion and that cost can mean a lot of things. Um, my question is about commercial fill loans. Um, right now, it's kind of front of mind with the uh, one-time account adjustment that's going to be completed by July of this year, uh, really trying to get everybody into a direct loan right now. So I guess I'm just wondering, you know, with this specifically kind of how the department imagines the commercial fill loans fitting in. As I mentioned, at this point, these are going to be department held loans. So commercial fell is not a department held loan. So at this point in time, we are not considering fell for this hardship regulation. OK, thank you, Lean and Tammy. Um, Angelica, you are next. Yes, um, I just have clarification for one. My first clarifying question, are we allowed to submit comments regarding regarding paragraph B? <clears throat> um, we're going to move to paragraph B next. We're going to take them paragraph by paragraph. OK, no problem. Okay. All right, thank you. Jessica. Hi, uh, just have one minor comment to start, which is that I think the department may want to consider using the word waiver rather than forgiveness in the title just to be parallel with some of the other things in the regs but that's that's your decision not mine um i substantively i i think there's one group of borrowers that i'd like to make sure are included in here um which are borrowers who have court judgments against them here in new york city we see these borrowers i know that they're common across the country you know, I have clients who are facing homelessness and have a judgment from the Department of Education. Um, th those those judgments can be a real hardship on people and often people get to the point of having a judgment against them because of the extreme hardship that they've experienced. It's led to that point, as you noted, the hardship that can come with default. Um, I think, you know, having a judgment against you from the department is often just bad luck in different geographic areas across the country are treated differently. Here in New York, um, people with low balances who live in Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island can get sued on their student loans, whereas if you happen to live in Manhattan, which is more expensive, you can't get sued unless you have a higher judgment amount. So I understand the legal framework for judgments can be complicated and there may be external reasons why people with judgments aren't aren't always eligible for waiver, but I would propose that, that the department not tie its hands here and just add um, into this language 
um, something along the lines of whether or not such loan has been reduced to judgment that would just essentially preserve the department's flexibility going forward to apply these financial hardship standards to loans with judgments. I think that that's a, a population that really experiences financial hardship that often doesn't have eligibility for other forms of relief. And I can put that language in. Okay, thank you, Jessica, appreciate it. Other comments, questions, suggestions for the department on um, paragraph A? Wisdom? Uh, good morning. Um, I was wondering if, uh, just a clarifying question, um, if folks were to consolidate loans into direct, uh, would they still be eligible? Yes, if they are a direct loan borrower, which would include consolidation, they would be, um, it would be included, yes. Thank you. Thank you. John Waitlaw. Yes, and at the sort of hesitation of trying to, I think, push, quote, correct something my friend Jessica said, I think when she's meant, when she said financial hardship, she means hardship more generally, not not a narrow definition in terms of financial hardship. Um, but that being said, I totally agree with her approach to that and that it's, um, and I do think, I, you know, I want to express my appreciation for the department for coming forward with this, with this complicated process, but I do think it's important in terms of how we discuss it to talk about hardship more generally than in a narrow financial hardship context and that there are other things that are um, beyond a narrow version of what financial hardship means um, directly. Um, uh, and that again, I encourage just as the department has indicated, I think earlier that it's going to view the terms costs of enforcement broadly and beyond the quote mere costs to the, um, to the government. I applaud that approach and encourage the department to uh, uh, apply that approach to all of the various subparts that we're going to discuss today. Thank you, John. Tammy, you had your hand up. Do you? Still I was simply to... just going to thank everybody, and I just decided that I would just do that when I started paragraph B. Sorry. Oh, oh no worries. No worries. Anyone else on paragraph A? Jalil. Just clarification um, if I want to make sure I understood this correctly as we discuss paragraph B we'll be able to come back um, to touch on some of the items like costs or fully repay or uh, benefits of continued collection I just that was my understanding from, from kind of Tammy's response to me is that when we get into section B we also can have a discussion around kind of how those two paragraphs interplay so just want to clarify that before we move to B Absolutely. OK. OK. All right, I don't see any further hands on paragraph A, Tammy. So you want to take us into paragraph B? I would love to, Cindy, thank you. If the screen sharers would put paragraph B, section B up, that would be great. Excuse me, paragraph B up. Getting my sections and my paragraphs mixed up. <laughs> Moving on to paragraph B. This paragraph is a list of the non-exclusive factors that we believe could be relevant to determining hardship. We're interested in your feedback regarding these factors. These are factors that used alone or in combination with other factors relate to showing hardship. Under these proposed regulations, the secretary could consider the borrower's total debt balances owed on the eligible loans in providing relief to borrowers, which was a recommendation taken from our last session. This list also includes predictive factors, including many that the department already has, such as time and repayment, loan status, degree attainment, repayment plan, institution attended, outstanding debt, Pell Grant recipient, income reported on the free application for federal student aid or the FAFSA, and completion status. There are also borrower specific factors that the department does not have that could also be used. This includes things brought up in prior negotiation sessions, such as borrower's disability or the cost burden from things like medical or dependent care. The ways in which the department would use these factors are described in paragraphs C and D, which will be discussed later. For now, we want to focus on whether this is the right list of factors or not. 
So with that in mind, we'll turn it back over to FMCS for discussion and questions on paragraphs uh, B, excuse me, B. Okay, thank you, Tammy, for walking us through that. So we'll open the floor for discussion, questions, suggestions. Angelica, thank yes. you for taking us off. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I apologize about earlier. It's still seven o'clock here on the West Coast, so mm -hmm. I'm catching up. I apologize. Um, yes, I just have questions about item number seven. It says re uh, receipt of a Pell Grant or in other information from the FAFSA form. Now, one is referring to the result of the FAFSA, while one is report, it appears to be referring to the data reported on the FAFSA. And we know that um, the FAFSA has also changed <laughs> um, from prior to the current year that we're in. So I'm really trying to get a hold on the reference of what other information is being referred to reported on the FAFSA as some elements may shift from year over year. And also wondering if um, students or the department will have access to FAFSA information after the FAFSA year has closed. Um, so one is appears to be reporting to uh, referring to A2. Um, so not sure if it's referring to need-based aid as a holistic um, point of view, whether the student has received FSEOG or other need-based aid. Um, it's, it appears to be referring to two different particular areas is what I'm seeing. And also the latter area may be of a concern when you're referring to the um, significant changes that recently happened to the FAFSA form. So first off, we're looking at Pell Grant recipients. So we, we haven't, to my knowledge, and, and we'll have to discuss this, but we have not looked at need-based aid as far as FSCOG or federal work study. Um, we have not explored that option, but we do know that the data that we receive when a, when a borrower was in school, because more than likely these borrowers are no longer in school because they're experiencing hardship because they're in repayment, and that would be something as if they were a Pell Grant recipient in the past. As far as data received on changes in FAFSA, you know, what we plan to do is use these factors in conjunction with each other to kind of get at the heart of where a borrower might be in their repayment or, or experiencing their hardship. So we might use a Pell Grant recipient. We might use additional information received from the borrower themselves. And it's, it's meant to be, um, again, not an all-inclusive list. So as far as the other questions, um, we'll have to take the rest of your question back and, and come back with an answer when we've had a chance to digest it a little bit more, but I hope that at least answers part of your question. Angelica, anything you wanted to add? Okay, no, can we do? I, I'll ahead. just do some more clarifying notes in the in the chat here. Okay. Right. But yeah, can we, can we did fulfill our comments? Okay, thanks. Um, I have a note here that Richard Haas is stepping in as primary for graduate borrowers, and he is in queue. But before him is Ashley Pizzuti. Hi, thank you. Um, I just want some clarification about, um, I know it's going to be, the hardship is going to be around household income. Is the household debt also going to be considered? Um, especially for those married filing jointly. Um, I know quite a few married couples who also have, have partners with student loan debt. Some of that debt is private. Um, there's also medical debt um, and other debts that should be weighed against that. Um, or is that only considering the, the actual person holding the student loan debt? Um, so I just want some clarification regarding um, if debt, total house hold the debt is going to be taken into consideration. I think one of the things that the department is trying to do is to have a very broad stroke across what hardship means for each individual borrower. 
And and while we have some ways of identifying certain things, we certainly will not know borrower specific hardship issues until they explain it to us, until they show it to us. And, and that may be an application process. So it's the debt of the borrower, but we do also welcome thoughts on the non-student um, loan debt. So I think that if you have suggestions for that, um, that would be helpful. We will detail the expenses of the household, child care, health care, and things like that. So I think we're trying to take that broad approach and look at it holistically. Okay, thank you. Richard? Hi, good morning, yes. Uh, actually, my question was and my comment were kind of related to that as well. I, I do appreciate in uh, identifying the factors that are substantiating hardship here that we've created room to recognize uh, costs of things like housing um, and household income and how all these things factor in here. So I just wanted to clarify and again, thank the department if we're now creating some of this breathing room to adjust for regionally um, regional variations in cost of living. Uh, because I know that's something that that we've discussed in the past. So uh, I am thankful that that's there. Uh, I did have one question here. I was curious if there was any discussion um, about borrowers who were harmed by servicer errors or anything like that, if that came up in any of the hardship discussion, because I don't see those people identified here. Not sure that Tammy has an immediate response to that. I do. Okay. I do. All right. Just gotta <laughs> find my button. Sorry. Um, when errors, when servicing errors are made, we fix them and we seek to hold our borrowers harmless. Um, we have addressed many historical servicer errors through the IDR account adjustment. So in this particular instance, we are looking at the hardship of the borrowers and all of those non-exhaustive list of factors and, and other things in the reg text that we proposed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Scott Waterman. Thank you. A question for Tammy. How do you define household? I think for the purposes of this proposed regulatory text, we probably will take that back I don't know that we are going to define household any differently than we define it in in other um, in other ways when we talk about the FAFSA and, and household size, but I'd like to take that one back. So let us circle back with you on that, Scott, if that's okay. Tammy, would you like that in the chat, or do you have? Another? I would absolutely like that in the chat, Cindy. Thank you for suggesting oh. that. All right, Scott, can you take care of that for us? Thank you. Um, next up is Ed Boltz, who has come to the table in place of uh, the primary. So, Ed? Ed, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, I, I want, you know, the, I wanted to follow up related to, to, to two of the recent things that were, were brought up. The first is um, very grateful, especially with the past things that, you know, that the department has said in regards to the consumer debt balances under B6 here um, that, you know, my hope and is that there's further clarification that borrowers who are getting other sorts of debt relief, whether that's through other programs, bankruptcy or elsewhere, that the fact that they're getting that relief um, is that the, that the other debt balances will be used as of the date of their, uh, you know, when they're, they're going in, not that the fact that they're getting whether it's a bankruptcy discharge of some debts or getting assistance from a, you know, regarding a mortgage deficiency from a housing finance authority, that those don't get held against them where they have to choose between student loan relief and saving their home in many circumstances. And I also, in regards to the questions about servicer errors that were br just brought up, I do want to again commend the Department of Education for its work with the Department of Justice, where in its student loan guidance for bankruptcy discharges, it fully recognized that a lot of the hardships that borrowers suffered were because servicers often put people into improper forbearances rather than the appropriate income-driven repayment plan over time and hope that that can be reiterated 
as part of, of this hardship process too, because that that goes to show the the you know that many people who didn't pay on their student loans or enroll in IDR programs did so not because of their own errors, but because of servicers and who you know and the despair that they were put into because of that the servicer problems. But thank you for for all of this good work. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate that. I just want to make a note that uh, Jalil has come back to the table as primary. So next up is Lane Thompson. Yeah, I also wanted to speak to the servicer error and malfeasance um, topic. I know this has been a, a big topic that I've been bringing to the table, but it's because I work directly with borrowers. Um, and a lot of times the reason they end up with me is because they've exhausted every other possible route to address the issue. And generally that's because the issue is completely outside of their control, meaning the hardship was that the servicer incorrectly copied and pasted the wrong social security number or the servicer lost the last payment history prior to 2006 or the servicer. So I just really want to point out that borrowers are not being held harmless for servicer error. Borrowers are being expected to pay on loans that there is poor record keeping on. And I just really want to keep that front of mind. Um, I think there's a lot of really excellent stuff covered here in hardship. And I want to make sure that we're really including those hardships that were 100% completely outside of people's um, control. So that's kind of why I bring up that FFELP, the commercial loans as well, because folks didn't decide to take loans that aren't owed by, owned by the department, right? That had to do with the time period they took them out. So um, just really reiterating that there is a, a big issue with servicer error. It's not um, a one-off that borrowers are held harmless. Thank you. Thank you, Lane. Um, I just want to um, welcome back Jessica Renucci to the table as primary again. With that, uh, next up is Yael Shavit. Hi, thank you. Um, so I do also want to speak to servicing error and to two two particular pieces of it. So first, while I do appreciate the efforts that the department has made recently to address historical servicing failures, I think it's incontrovertible that there are many borrowers who are um, uh, facing the burdens of debt that they would not be in right now were it not for historical servicing errors and that the experience of borrowers writ large in this regard is not that they feel that they've been uh, held harmless and or that practically they have been held harmless. And so I, I do think it is critical that Ed, um, create space and take into consideration the consequences of, of servicing failures in its hardship uh, standard. And one thing that I also want to make sure isn't lost in this discussion, I think when we talk about servicing error, there it, it is often the case that like we go into our heads into a place where it seems like we're only talking about historical servicing error. There's absolutely no reason to think that there will not be significant servicing errors going forward. And while I think we all really hope that that doesn't happen, there are reasons to think right now that that is likely not going to be the case, right? And, um, you know, again, while everyone hopes that where there are servicing errors, it will be easy to fix them. I think it's critical given how hard the department has needed to work over the last few years to try and address the historical failures to ensure that there's an avenue for Ed to deal with those in a manner that can be, um, you know, expedited and more straightforward when they do happen going forward. And so, again, I think when considering what hardship means and all of the relevant uh, uh, components here, servicing error needs to be part of that conversation internally for Ed. And again, that doesn't just mean correcting problems that happened in the past. That means creating avenues for addressing problems that arise in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Butts. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to comment here. I, I'd like to encourage the department to um, consider as a factor um, public service workers who have um, provided often 10 years or more of public service and may still have remaining loans. There are any number of reasons why that could occur, some of which are servicing errors. Um, there are also, as we know, many public service professionals, including frontline healthcare workers, who just simply don't qualify for the forgiveness. And so we would like that to be a factor considered in um, as part of hardship. Um, also, uh, 
asked that the department uh, consider hardships from lost loved ones, particularly over the last uh, few years during COVID-19. Many students lost parents, grandparents, and other family members who were contributing or could contribute to their um, their higher education costs. And, and they are experiencing hardship, but it may not be um, apparent unless we look for that information. And then I did have one question, which is, are parent plus borrowers considered at all through what's being proposed? Not sure. Um, Kim, we may have to get back to you on that. Um, Sarah, oh, she might have um, some. Direct loans, yes. Plus borrowers, plus borrowers with direct loans, yes, are included in this. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you for all of the suggestions. And I know I'm not chiming in every single time that you guys are saying them, but I am writing them down. And we have a whole team that's writing these down. We really appreciate the formative discussion and the suggestions that you're making. And we will certainly take them back and look at them very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John Whitelaw. Yes, um, I just wanted to comment on the term household. Um, and I would urge the department to take a very broad approach to determining a household. Um, and to note that different government agencies take different positions on what is a household. And I, but <clears throat> from my experience working with families, families are complicated. There are often people in households who may not even be even technically in the blood sense related to other people in the household, but they are functioning as a household. And I would urge the department to take um, a broad view and not pin them when they when they get to be talking about this, not necessarily as defining it in a regulation, but actually employing the test um, to be flexible in who is considered a member of the household. There are many families who raise children who are not related to them not as part of any foster care system or anything official, but they are clearly part of a household. And I would just urge the department, if it's looking for either a regulatory or a sub-regulatory definition, to be very careful about defining it in a way that doesn't cover the expanse of families who live together in, in the United States. So I would just urge you to be very cautious about limiting that definition in a way that would remove your ability to count people when the circumstances suggest that it makes sense because they are functioning as a household regardless of their legal relationship. Thank you, John. Um, next up is Jalou. Um, I have a, a clarifying question and then a comment. Um, Tammy, for parent plus borrowers, are you saying parent plus borrowers who consolidate will be eligible, like the consolidation into it? Uh, direct loan? Yes, direct loans are eligible. That is correct. Thank you. Um, and then I think the, you know, looking through the 17 kind of factors of hardship, um, I think we have a, a good start here and possibly um, regulation that can really create the relief and I would even argue kind of the justice approach that's needed around student debt when we understand how hardship is um, unequally um, spread across communities of color, low-income communities, women, women of color, um, and so on. I think what is going to matter here is the technicalities of how um, this policy is implemented and how we're defining uh, terms here. So, for example, if we are going to return to a 25-year window to determine um, someone's the cost of enforcing full repayment, I think that can be really limiting for borrowers who need relief right now. I always like to remind us in these discussions that when someone takes out a student loan, that their goal of taking out that student loan wasn't simply to repay the loan, but it was to take out a student loan in order to have a thriving life, in order to be able to have class mobility, to be able to save for a home, to start a family, to be able to contribute to retirement. And that when we're trying to understand the cost, we want to have that broad perspective of saying, mm -hmm. what does it mean to keep people trapped in a student debt that's extracting from those original reasons why they took out the student debt. Um, and I just ask us to keep a broad definition um, of how we understand costs, how we understand what it means to measure whether or not a borrower can fully repay. 
um, and then understand the larger cost to society by having uh, 40 million plus borrowers under this extracting debt, understanding the cost to our economic growth, to our growth of businesses, to the cost of communities of color, having generations, both parents and grandparents and um, young adults having their wealth and income extracted each month. All of these costs are things that I'm just strongly encouraging the department to shape and how they implement this policy because this can be great in the regulatory text, but can then um, and implementation be really limited if we go back to sometimes narrow frames. Um, and then my, to end, my last question is that we mentioned Pell Grant um, borrowers as a, a indication of hardship, um, but can we speak to Parent PLUS borrowers who um, took out a Parent PLUS loan while their, their child received a Pell Grant? Bill, you have 30 seconds left. We know from the data that 59% um, of Parent PLUS borrowers since 2000 Received a Parent PLUS loan when they took out the Pell, the Pell, when their student took out Pell Grant. So, can we include them in this Pell Grant um, hardship factor? So, thank you. I first want to clarify something. When, when you asked the question about if a Fell PLUS loan borrower consolidated into the direct loan program, would would they be eligible for uh, if they were experiencing hardship? I also wanted to just clarify that an unconsolidated parent plus loan would be eligible already. So I just wanted to make sure that we we completely clarified that. I didn't want to have any confusion around that. The other thing is these are an, these are amazing suggestions that you guys are giving us so much to think about. It would be really helpful if you had some proposed regulatory language that you could um, put in the chat for us. If you have some suggestions on text, um, it's not that we want a whole list of, of uh, huge proposals, but if you have an idea of you know, how to define household or some of the things that you've been mentioning and, and you have a, a few words to help us uh, take back and look at that, that would be super helpful. Thank you, Tammy. And, and I just want to reinforce that. Um, you know, given the short turnaround here in the department, the sooner the department can get those types of um, proposed regulatory texts. Um, doesn't have to be like detailed, but like Tammy said, if you have an idea of how to define household in a few words, put it, you know, put it in the chat, get it to them as soon as possible. OK, um, and that's why I said in the beginning, if you have suggestions on, on, on regulatory texts, let's try to get them out there today and then so yes. that they can be in the brain in the brain going into uh, recess today. All right, Jessica, Tammy, did you have something else or? I do. Um, I also want to remind everybody that paragraph 17 says that the secretary may consider any other indicators of hardship. So we are using those very broad strokes that all of you are mentioning to us. And uh, I just wanted to point that to your attention. Thanks, Tammy. Jessica Renucci for Consumer Advocates. You're on mute, Jesse. Sorry. Uh, I, again, I just want to, you know, state my strong support for what the department is trying to do here. I really appreciate that you have taken into account what we've put forth in terms of a financial hardship that millions of Americans are facing and how urgently this relief is needed. I think I would just encourage at a high level the department to um, try its best to make sure that the borrowers are not going to fall into sort of like an, an accidental pitfall, I would say, in accessing this relief, you know, whether that be their servicer made a mistake or um, that, you know, they weren't aware of the, the, the value that could be had of consolidating their commercially held fell or heal loans. Um, and, and I think there's, I have a couple of minor tweaks to the language to that. And I would look at, you know, nine and 10, I think, in my work, I often will see a student who attends one program that, you know, maybe at a school that closed, for example, or a, a program that didn't work out and then is funneled into another similar program ends up leaving, you know, we'll often see students in like a cascade of school closures. And so I think it would be really, um, I wouldn't want that student to somehow get, 
not get relief to which they would otherwise be entitled just because they, they tried a second school and then left after a week because it didn't work out, for example. So I'm going to put some language in the chat that's just an attempt to clarify that um, I think the department should take into any school or program related factors should take into consideration like any attendance at any program and so you shouldn't, you know, just because you went to one program shouldn't exclude you from relief that was related to another program, if that makes sense. But the overall point is just, you know, I appreciate what you're doing here and I think um, I'd like to make sure there aren't sort of accidental pitfalls. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Appreciate that. Lane? Yeah, um, I have a, maybe a question and a suggestion around disability. Um, my question is, there's already a total and permanent disability discharge. So I guess my question is kind of what um, is the department thinking in terms of how disability might look like a hardship other than total and permanent? So we're looking at it very broadly and we would have to look at it on a you know a case by case basis and what the borrower presents to us through an application process because we obviously wouldn't have those pieces of information that we could pull from. Um, so when the borrower reaches out to us and reports it to us and maybe they they have issues that don't reach to the level of the total and permanent disability, we're going to look at that and as we build this hardship um path to forgiveness we're going to look at all of those different factors as the borrowers present that information to us and we're going to take everything into consideration at that time so it would be a bit we're, we're not looking to narrowly define every piece of what a hardship could be because hardship is different for everybody and i think if we try to narrowly define a hardship then we will most definitely miss and we don't want to do that to ourselves. We don't want to regulate ourselves into a very narrow path. The, the whole purpose of what we're trying to do in 30.91 is to have these broad strokes pathways to relief for borrowers who are experiencing hardship. We're looking at the information we do have on our systems, past uh, you know, schools, debt level, Pell Grant recipient, indicators of low income borrowers, things like that that can help us make informed decisions and additional information provided by our borrowers to help us meet them where they are in their respective situations. Great, um, so my suggestion on that same note is that I would really encourage the department to allow um, doctors, medical professionals to write a letter um, saying this is the disability rather than having to fill out a form. Um, the forms that currently exist, doctors tend to really not like. Um, so I just want to put that out there that it would be great if there's any space for like um, just a, a wider uh, net on what's acceptable to document disabilities. Um, yeah, just to clarify that doctors, for some reason, they really do not like filling out those forms and they uh, would in a lot of cases prefer to write their own letter um, and kind of, you know, not say things like when will this disability end, for example. Thank you. Thank you, Lane. Appreciate it. Um, Jalo. I just want to come back to uplift the idea that for, I think particularly for a parent plus borrowers, um, I know that the department received a um, letter from a group of senators this week advocating for parent plus borrowers to be more explicitly included in regulatory text. And I think um, as some of the negotiators are already asked for clarification, if borrowers are going to see this regulatory text, it's important for them to see themselves um, in the text so that they know that they're a part of intended relief. So I think something that explicitly can call out um, that parent plus loans are included um, in this text will be important if we want to reach those borrowers who have been excluded from other um, regulatory relief such as the safe plan. I think it's important to have them explicitly called out and named here so that they know that this is not another moment when uh, their type of loan is excluded from relief. Thank you, Jalil, and um, I would encourage you if you have a few words of regulatory text on that to put it in the chat. OK, thank you. John Waitlaw. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to provide some clarification perhaps for um, to answer in part Lane's questions. Um, the standard for TPD is quite onerous. 
Um, and there are people who are disabled in every real sense, but for various reasons, including ones you've mentioned, not be able to qualify for TPD. And I want to, uh, and I, uh, and I think putting disability in, as so long as folks understand that that means the entire point of the hardship exception is for to grant hardship to people who don't otherwise qualify for forgiveness. And I'm assuming by just putting the term disability, the department isn't restricting it to a specific form or any specific way of proving disability. I do think it's incredibly important to keep it in as a as a either complete or partial basis for forgiveness outside TPD, because for reasons that I am not going to like bore you all with the intimate details of um, being disabled and qualifying for TPD are two very different things. And I again, I think it is important and the department has recognized this that having disability as a separate category or as, you know a, a something that folks can talk about separate and apart from whether they make tpd is important and i don't want the department to try to narrowly define disability or how you show it um and though i do agree with lane which i think is not a subject for today's discussion but i completely agree with lane that the current TPD doctor forms are a hot mess, uh, but I also acknowledge and recognize that fixing that problem is a sub-regulatory matter that is not appropriate, not for, the, for this today's discussion, but is one where there could be fruitful discussion between disability advocates and the department about how to come up with a form that works better both for the department and for uh, individuals with disabilities. Thank you. Can I clarify that I wasn't, I don't mean that we should change the TPDD. That's not what I was saying. I was saying that when we're looking at disability here, I'm hoping we can do it differently than how it's been done previously. Okay, thank you both for that uh, uh, great conversation and clarity. Melissa Coons. Thank you. I, I have a few comments and a, a suggestion. First of all, I do want to add my thanks to the department organizing this uh, conversation today regarding hardship. I think it was very necessary and I'm glad you listened to the proposals of the participants here. So uh, again, my thanks. Uh, secondarily, I will agree that the language of the, the proposed regulation to include parents would be very um, important because as I read the uh, text today, the title says waiver of federal student loan debt. So when it was clarified, that this does include parent plus borrowers, I was pleasantly surprised. So thank you for that. Uh, otherwise, I would not have thought to ask. So I'm glad that we are talking about parent plus borrowers in this mix all. And to, to include more information on the disability concept, I am all for writing regulations that are very broad-based, open-ended, and wide to interpretation because that does give the interpreters the ability to add flexibility to how they interpret this. So I'm not necessarily a, a fan of very nuanced regulations for that speed, for that uh, purpose. However, I will ask that in this context, when we're talking about disability, applying it to parent plus borrowers, can we implicitly include that a parent plus borrower who has a student for whom they borrowed the plus loan becomes disabled and unable to put their education to work, be considered as a part of a waiver authority. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, again, I would encourage you to um, put some consolidated um, regulatory text proposal language around that for the department to consider. I show one more hand um, and then I think we're going to take a uh, 15 minute break um, before we uh, continue with uh, discussion and moving on to other paragraphs. So Wisdom, you are up. Definitely. Uh, I just want to agree uh, with my colleagues around the table, um, just around the, the work done by the department, um, by the secretary uh, to really bring this uh, session together. I definitely want to second the broad definitions around uh, disability, um, I added some regulatory or some recommended text in the chat uh, to check out as well. Um, I just want to highlight three points 
um, that I think can really continue to strengthen this, particularly for uh, communities of color, uh, for black borrowers who are disproportionately impacted by the, the burden of student debt um, because they are coming in at a, a weaker economic base. Um, the first being you know, an explicit consideration of racial and economic disparities, um, amending the criteria to explicitly include considerations of racial and economic disparities that affect borrowers' ability to repay the loan. Uh, this could involve incorporating metrics that reflect systemic disadvantages or barriers faced uh, by borrowers of color. Um, the second being community and environmental factors, adding criteria that accounts for borrowers living in economically disadvantaged or high cost living areas, recognizing that such environmental factors um, are significant impacts on one's financial uh, stability and ability to repay debt. And the third being um, historical debt patterns, including a review of historical debt patterns and their impact on borrowers, acknowledging the past discriminatory lending practices and disparities in wealth accumulation that can affect the current ability to manage debt. Um, and I can definitely provide um, some text as well. Thanks, Wisdom. Ashley Pizzuti, um, I thought when I started to speak about where we were gonna cut off, I had seen two hands, Wisdom and yours, but my, uh, my face overshadowed your box window. So if you still have a comment, please let's uh, um, have you state that. Great. Um, first of all, I'm having some internet issues right now. So um, I was going to maybe wait until after the break, um, okay. but we'll go ahead and, and ask my question and maybe we can just visit it after. Um, I just wanted a little bit of clarification around the sector and level of institution attended um and what that uh really means in a broad stroke does that mean those um for profits you know what what does that encompass okay not sure they um have an immediate response on that so if we could just um put that in the chat actually that would be great um, I, I, I can't say if they'll have a response when we come back or not, but um, please. Cindy, um, put, it yeah. is the type of institution, um, so it could be proprietary, nonprofit. So okay. it's the type of institution that we're talking about. Does that answer your question, Ashley? I think she's, oh. Um, yes. Okay. It, it does a little, little bit. Maybe we can get into that a little bit later on um, on how that's going to be determined um, in creating hardship. Is it going to be the amount of our defense applications or or you know lawsuits against the school? So I'm just wondering if we can touch on that. But I know this is kind of a loaded question. So you know if we need more time after the break, I'm happy to jump after the break for that. Okay. Thank you. So um, with that, I would like to call a 15 minute break. It's 1112. Let's resume at 1130 uh, to make it easy and uh, we'll do um, move forward with our discussion and paragraph C. See um, you at uh, 1130. If we could pause the live stream, I'd appreciate it.
Okay, welcome back. Um, I hope you enjoyed that well needed 15 minute break there for stretching and what have you. So with that, let's pick back up, Tammy. Yes, ma'am. We want to kind of circle back to what Ashley was saying about um, the type of institution. Um, the secretary is going to consider information available to him. And one way we consider hardship is the effect on a borrower's ability to successfully repay the debt in full. Sector of institution is helpful in understanding this ability because it's a predictive of a likelihood of default or delinquency. So that's how we anticipate using um, the sector information to help us define hardship for a, that a borrower may be experiencing. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah Buck. Um, thank you, Tammy. Can you give us an example of what a sector may be for this purpose? Proprietary, not not for profit, public, four year, two year, community college, technical college. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tammy, I don't see any further hands. Do you want to move on to Start paragraph C before lunch. We will yes. break at noon for lunch. So yes, ma'am. Let's do okay. that. Um, well, my lovely screen sharers, please go ahead and uh, screen share paragraph C. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Under paragraph C, the regulations would outline a model that could be used to predict the likelihood of default. The goal of this provision would be to provide automatic relief to one portion of the student borrower population that we know has experienced or is experiencing hardship. The proposed standard of 80% or greater likelihood of default in the next two years is intended to provide relief for those who are clearly experiencing hardship. Here's how the model would work. Based on the factors in paragraph B and any other factors identified by the department, Borrowers who are predicted to be at least 80% likely to be in default at any point in the two years from the date in which the final regulation is effective would be eligible for this relief. The development of the model is ongoing. The model uses appropriate statistical and machine learning techniques, historical data currently available to the department, and with consideration of best practices used by other agencies and in research literature. The variables used in the model could include factors listed in the proposed regulatory text in paragraph B, as well as other factors already available to the department that are not listed. Now, I want to elaborate on the treatment of defaulted student loan borrowers under this paragraph. As a reminder, borrowers are not currently facing the consequences of default because of the Fresh Start initiative. Fresh Start is a temporary initiative implemented by the department that offers special benefits for borrowers with defaulted federal student loans, including stopped collections, restored ability to rehabilitate a defaulted loan, and to be reported in good standing to credit reporting agencies. All borrowers who were in default prior to the pandemic temporarily have the benefits of Fresh Start through September 2024. Borrowers must opt into Fresh Start to keep the benefits long term. The main limiting the main limiting principle of this proposed regulatory provision, however, is that borrowers must be predicted to default in the next two years. <laughs> Excuse me. This means that borrowers have opted into Fresh Start and are likely to be in default based on the hardship factors used by the department's predictive model would be eligible for the relief. The same applies for defaulted borrowers who do not opt into Fresh Start. If a borrower who defaulted prior to the pandemic does not opt into Fresh Start and is at least 80% likely to be in default in the next two years, under the department's model, they would be eligible for relief. Conversely, if a borrower is less than 80% likely to default in the next two years, but does default, that borrower would not be eligible for relief under this pathway to relief though they may be eligible under other hardship relief described in this section. 
Another important another important point here is how this provision works with the on ramp transition policy. The Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023 ended the student loan payment pause last fall. The department created a temporary on ramp period through September 30th, 2024 to help borrowers successfully return to repayment. This on ramp period protects borrowers from having a delinquency reported to credit reporting agencies. The clock to default will not begin until the end of the on ramp period. It takes at least 270 days for a borrower to default on a loan, and that means that a borrower cannot default until 270 days after September 30th, 2024. The predictive model is intended to identify borrowers who have reasonably high likelihood of defaulting in the near future, meaning between the final rules effective date and two years from that date. Finally, this provision is written as an automatic and a one-time benefit. However, paragraph D is written as an ongoing, as written as ongoing, which we will discuss in later detail. We will discuss later in detail. However, borrowers who do, who do not receive automatic relief under paragraph C could apply for relief under paragraph D once the secretary determines when and how to stand up an application. We'll turn it over to FMCS for discussion and questions on paragraph C. Okay, thank you, Tammy, for that overview. So with that, um, the floor is open for discussion, comments, and suggested um, regulatory texts. Jalil. Thank you, Tammy. Um, just question to get some clarification. So for borrowers who um, have come out of default because of Fresh Start or um, other programs. Can you just give me a little bit more clarification around kind of the look back period? I'm trying to understand how this model is going to apply to uh, borrowers who, you know, were in default until the Fresh Start program and, you know, likely would um, potentially go into default again or would be experiencing a large level of hardship. So just trying to understand what the look back period would be for a borrower who's out of default now because of Fresh Start? So a borrower that pursues Fresh Start could still be viewed as having a risk of redefaulting in that period. Borrowers who have opted into Fresh Start and demonstrate indicators of hardship, including those in paragraph B, such that they are likely to be in default under the predictive model would be eligible for relief. And if Fresh Start borrowers are likely to be in default under Ed's model, they will be eligible for relief. OK, so a bar. So for those of us who, you know, have spent the last couple of years helping borrowers, if we told a borrower to use Fresh Start to pull themselves out of default, they are now in one of the many different repayment plans. There still could be a possibility that they could get immediate relief if your model shows that they could be at risk of defaulting again. Um, is that a correct understanding? So yes, what you're saying is correct, but I, I want to make sure that we understand this is not based on a look back period. It's based on if you're predicted to be in default. So we're not looking back anywhere. We're looking at the factors and the model that predicts whether or not you're likely to default within the two years. OK, so then if a borrower comes out of if, if a borrower went through Fresh Start, let's say they're enrolled in um, save or ICR, in theory, they could have a zero dollar payment and they, in theory, would not be um, in danger of default. But if they stayed in default, they would get immediate relief. I'm trying to just understand, like, if if some folks could be uh, excluded here because they use Fresh Start two months or, you know, a, few, a year or, or some months earlier from the immediate relief that's being offered here. I think I'd like to take that one back and come back because a borrower that per pursues Fresh Start could still be viewed as having a risk of redefaulting in that period. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Ed Bolcher next, could you, there you are, thank you. Thank you. Um, my question relates to, again, as usual with for me, for many, many borrowers may be in a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, which lasts for as long as five years. During that time, historically, the Department of Ed and its servicers have put people into an administrative forbearance. Will 
this the default provision allow people who are unable to pay anything during that extent period that's likely to extend even beyond the two years uh, that that the regulation is contemplating because they are in bankruptcy allow for them to get the automatic forgiveness uh, automatic um, hardship discharge because of that or will they be precluded because of their bankruptcy status? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ed. I think Tammy needs a moment. Let's just uh, take a second here. We get we can get back to you on the, the bankruptcy question. Okay. Ed. Thank you. Thank you, Soren, for you stepping bet. in. Yeah. I'll, I'll back for Jessica again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Um, Scott Buchanan. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I think we all can agree sort of, you know, we want regulatory benefits to actually reach borrowers, right? Um, and this proposed regulation is incredibly vague, ambiguous, and untethered to statute in such a way that it actually does not obligate the department to forgive, waive, or whatever you want to call it, a single loan but could also equally be sort of an arbitrarily massive expansion of authority um, uh, beyond statute. It doesn't define any metric term or eligibility requirement, and this will lead to pretty much mass borrower confusion if this, if this regulation move forward, which can harm bars, the student loan program, and the FISC. Uh, ambiguity allows whipsawing policies and disparate bar treatment depending upon political wins or administrations just as we saw with borrower defense. Regulations should be definitive guidelines that borrowers and those who advise them can rely upon and plan around. Um, so we urge the department to reconsider this vaporous language and craft a proposal that can withstand judicial scrutiny and that borrowers can understand and actually rely upon. Um, as such, I have three questions, I think, to propose uh, to, to put to the department. Um, can you give an example under this drafting of a specific borrower and their characteristics who would get forgiveness? And can you give an example of a specific borrower and their characteristics who would not get forgiveness under this regulation? Um, the other question I would have is, you know, can you describe sort of the, uh, the magical model here um, for, uh, for uh, um, considering those who are likely to default? What are the factors? What are the weighting of those factors that the department would consider um, so that bars could actually understand who might actually be eligible and who might not be eligible. And then a final question is a practical one. So how does the department plan to staff for implementing this? Um, we've seen other proposals that have taken years for the department to implement. Um, the department is grossly understaffed for its current demands under the statute. And this expansion, which would require sort of assessing individual characteristics for potentially millions of borrowers, would require staffing that is on enormous scale. How does the department plan to address that issue, given the fact that it is not in control of its own uh, resources and uh, staffing size? So, Scott, the development of the model is ongoing, and we are using appropriate statistical and machine learning techniques, historical data currently available to the department with consideration of best practices and um, some of the other things that are out in the industry at the moment. Forgive me. <coughs> I am so sorry. Excuse me, y'all. Um, the inputs into the model could also include predictive factors listed in the proposed regulatory text, paragraph B, as well as other factors already available to the department that are not necessarily listed. Um, <clears throat> additionally, The implementation details could be shared once we have final rules in place and we would consider workload carefully in whatever we do at the department. Um, our language contains provisions that would allow for automatic relief for some borrowers and we will continue to consider the best way to stand up an application process. Some of what you're asking us is, uh, you know, we're ongoing in our development of what we're doing and what we're seeking your input on. Thank you. Um, Yael, you are up next. Thank you. Um, so a couple of points. First, with the caveat that 
you know, I assume that more detail about the actual model that the department would would be using would be available at the time that there is a proposed rule, not a final rule. Um, but not speaking to, you know, without being able to obviously to comment on the details of that, I'd like to just say that I think the exercise of identifying people who are likelihood of default is very far from vague and in fact quite specific and a responsible effort for the department to take in trying to identify those people who are at need of uh, relief under this type of provision. So I disagree strongly with Scott's premise there. I'd also like to note that the department typically drafts its regulations in uh, shall as opposed to may language. So to Scott's point as well, there is nothing aberrational about the department maintaining discretion in this kind of regulation. It is typical for the department's practice. So I would like to commend the department in generally speaking on endeavoring to, to do this. And I think it's both a constrained and appropriate use of the department's authority. With that said, obviously, you know, I, it will be interesting to see what the predictive model ultimately looks like that the department proposes. And the one piece that I, I did want to ask questions about here is the 80% um, threshold that is identified here. It strikes me that where the department has determined that somebody is more likely than not to default in the next two years, that is both a reasonable and adequate um, measure for when a person should get relief. And uh, you know, and, and more than that, all of the commensurate things that go along with it, like, the, you know, the uh, burden on the borrower who is likely to default of continuing to in the near term of continuing uh, the efforts of repayment and, and, you know, the cost to the department and to taxpayers for continuing to try to get money from people who, again, are more likely than not to default. So I was hoping, Tammy, that you might be able to give a little bit of a of more of a window into that 80 percent. I'm going to do my best to try to do that without coughing. Um, the goal of this provision is to provide automatic relief to one portion of the student borrower population that we know is experiencing hardship, such that they have a reasonable, reasonably high likelihood of defaulting in the near future. We don't want to use a percentage that's too low to accurately capture the population of borrowers that are experiencing hardship. And we think that the 80% properly balances, including um, borrowers who are likely to face hardship. So that's why we chose 80%. Okay, thank you. Jessica Renucci. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the department for putting out this proposal in a couple of respects. Um, but I want to start by echoing what Yael said. I think that it Borrowers who are more likely than not to default in the in, in the immediate term are borrowers who are experiencing hardship. There are borrowers who are experiencing many of the factors that are outlined in B. And I think that that is a like an, is a policy matter, an appropriate group of students who can get relief. I think B is a regulatory matter. The department preserving its authority to immediately waive the loans of those borrowers. Um, were that regulatory text to be added, I do not believe would foreclose what the perm is proposing to do right now. And so I think it might be prudent to include those in the regulations. I just want to speak uh, to a couple of other things that I appreciate about this proposal. I think that it is the department, as I understand it, is using a model that has been tested and validated. Um, I think that that is a good approach to use in terms of something that's inherently predictive. I also appreciate that the department here is being transparent about its intended use in the near term of its more general regulatory authority. I think that that transparency to the public and to us is valuable. I think in terms of burden, I don't, I know I say this all the time, but I don't want to forget that when you waive people's student loans, those people stop calling their servicers. They stop calling the department. That eases a burden on the student loan system. And I think we can't forget that the waiver itself has spillover effects in terms of making the student loan system work for people who are who are left with student loans after a certain exercise of waiver authority. Um, and I also understand you to be saying that this is an automatic, uh, a proposal for a form of automatic relief, which I strongly support. Um, that being said, one minor comment is I, it, in align with what I said earlier, I think it might make more sense here to use the term waive, not discharge as you've used in the other regulations. OK, thank you, Jessica. Appreciate those comments and suggestions. Um, Jalil. Thank you. 
Um, I just so I know we don't know yet what the model um, will look like and exactly what will be the variables and the approach, but I think it's important for us to just uplift that we know so much about um, borrowers who are likely to default, borrowers who have been in default. We know that they are experiencing a lot of what we are using in Section B to define hardship. And I think that this should be an approach that this model should be something that can capture what we know from the evidence, what we know from talking to borrowers. Um, and not some, this shouldn't be something that's applied narrowly. And I think it's just important to make that explicit. Um, you know, throughout this whole entire um, rulemaking sessions, I've made a point to highlight Ben Miller's research because I think Ben is right here at the department's um, assistance. So Ben showed that for every $40 that we pay to debt collection agencies, uh, we only, the Department of Ed only collects back a dollar. So we are already spending um, a lot of money to try to track down, harass, and extract income from borrowers who simply don't have the money. Um, so that's kind of underscores Jessica's point that not only would this be relief for borrowers, but it would be relief on an overall student loan system that is often spending unnecessary funds to try to collect money that borrowers simply do not have. Um, and again, I would just underscore that we know default borrowers are struggling and that we should apply, apply this broadly. Apply to borrowers who are on a zero dollar repayment plan. Apply to borrowers who have been in default um, for multiple years in the past, but apply this broadly so that we can provide relief immediately to those that we know are either on the edge of default or have had deep hardships because they have navigated the trenches of being in default. OK, thank you, Jalil. Appreciate that. Lane Thompson. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to the idea of the administrative burden um, and default. I know that a lot of folks who are in default end up taking up a lot of service or time because they're trying to figure out what their options are. I also know that a lot of folks who default once default again. Um, so when we're talking about the administrative burden, if those loans weren't on the books and servicers didn't have to take a call every time that they missed a payment, um, I think that would be really to everyone's advantage. Um, I just want to kind of say as a technical point, it might be good to include defaulted or re-defaulted um, just to kind of make it very clear that people who partook in Fresh Start aren't excluded from this. Um, so, you know, that have this potential to default or to re-default. Um, and just kind of the, the last point I want to make is that a default is nine months of mispayments. So I really want to make sure that we're all thinking about this as predicting somebody who is 80% likely to not be able to make nine months worth of payments is really quite a high bar. Um, so I think, you know, I think even below 80% would make sense. Um, because we're talking about, you know, if you're nine months behind on something, you've got probably some pretty big financial issues going on. Okay, thanks, Lane. If there's any of that that you um, have some uh, regulatory text that you'd like to put in the chat, that would be great, or at least capture your concepts. Jessica Renucci. Uh, may I interrupt? Uh, uh, sorry, I don't want to interrupt oh, I'm you, sorry, Jessica, but I want to respond to that. I'm sorry, I couldn't get my my thing off of mute. But um, you know, the department's proposal is 80 percent. But Lane, if you have some suggestions for a different set of parameters, along with a rationale for those parameters, we would be happy to consider them. So if you feel like there is a percentage that may more adequately represent um, hardship in that manner or the likelihood to default, please go ahead and include that information for us and uh, let us take a look at it. Okay, thanks Tammy. Okay, Jessica, uh, you're up now. Thanks, I was just uh, wondering if Ed could speak to the, um, the phrase all or part of the federally held student loans. I understand why you would want to preserve the authority to waive portions of loans in the, in the general authority, but as to this specific exercise of authority, it seems to me that given, as Lane mentioned, the extremely high burden here, uh, and as I understand it, it looks like you're looking at a borrower by borrower level, not a loan by loan level. So I don't think consolidation would be an issue. I was just wondering if if we might be able to strike that and just 
say that you intend to waive the borrower's full loan balance, or maybe there's something I don't see here. So Jessica, this is full or partial relief. So it could be either. So in paragraph um, paragraph A, the text states that the secretary may waive up to the outstanding balance of a loan owed to the department. If partial relief is what guides that choice, we're interested in identifying how to provide relief that is proportionate to the degree of hardship being faced by the borrowers. So if you have some thoughts on how to do that, or you see this as something where the department's consistent practices over time would build up transparency in how we award that type of relief, we'd be greatly interested in that information. Yeah, I'm not sure that really answered the question. You are fine to answer it after lunch, but I, I understand that conceptual point as to A and B, but I'm just not, since C, in my view, appears to be something that the department is ready to do soon, I'm curious what the department's actual plans are soon, and if they're in fact to waive borrowers full balances, I think it might be better to be explicit about that now. Okay, thank, thank you, Jessica. Um, it's 11.57. We are scheduled to break at noon. We're going to take John and uh, Yael and then uh, take our lunch break. So, um, John? Very briefly, two points. Um, I you know, significantly um, disagree with Scott and his opposition to this provision um, and offer support for it. And I also just can't help but note the irony that many of the borrowers in default um, and borrowers with difficulties uh, are as a result of errors by you know, student loan services, yet it is the student loan service um, alliance, um, the student loan services that are opposing this relief. And I strongly support the department's effort here um, to grant relief based upon a predictive model. Okay, thanks, Jen. Uh, Yael? Thanks. So, you know, Tammy, having having heard the explanation and the subsequent discussion, I will just state and, you know, I, I do think that the appropriate um, uh, metric here is more likely than not to default in the next two years. Again, you know, the department's creating a model and, and can control to some extent the um, uh, level of confidence in that, in, in that model, accurately predicting that someone is in fact more likely than not to default. But I think that is really sort of the appropriate measure in light of, you know, the department's, I think, um, uh, appropriate effort here to identify quickly people who are at, in, in great need and have kind of a demonstrated um, a demonstrated need based on the factors that are in the departments available to the department. So that's that's one point. And as to the other, I think, um, I mean, what I'm hearing Jessica to be saying here, and particularly in light of the discussion around the administrative costs associated with continuing to collect on, on loans of people who are going to be defaulting, is that, again, notwithstanding the uh, discretion the department is, is keeping for partial or full relief as to A and B generally, that in C in particular, it seems appropriate to just do it as a as full relief in order to achieve what I understand the department's goals of C to be. And I'm having a little bit of a tough time picturing um, the way in which partial relief could kind of be applied in the context where the department is determining that people are unlikely unlikely to be able to to pay their debt, like are likely to default period and within a certain period of time. So, again, without sort of conflating this discussion as to the broader discussion about the possibility of partial relief for A and B, I think for C, it does read to me as raising a slightly different concern. The same way, you know, I, I'm sharing Jessica's question and um, comment here and would be interested to hear more about any plans the department does have in that context, specifically with respect to Section C, to the extent there's something the department can share after lunch or tomorrow. We really appreciate your feedback and, and we will consider your comments. Thanks. Mm -hmm. OK, um, with that, we are going to be breaking for lunch. But before we break, I want to remind our um, participants um, that are viewing this live over the live stream to please use the correct link for this afternoon session as it is different than the one that you used this morning. So please make sure that you um, 
use the new link so that you're able to continue viewing. So with that, we'll go ahead and break for lunch from 12 and we will resume promptly at one. So if you could come back a few minutes before one so that we can get situated and on camera and ready to go at one, I'd appreciate it. Thank you.